Hello. In this video, we will explain to you what happened in the Orange County derivative debacle. We will do this by going through three chapters. In the first chapter, we will give you a brief explanation of the whole story. In the second chapter, we will go through all the financial risks that were taken. In the third and last chapter, we will see what lessons we learned from this debacle. Enjoy. So the story revolves around the treasurer of Orange County in the 1990s. Orange County is located in the southern part of California and had a population of 2.5 million people. The county's primary source of revenue derived from property taxes collected from occupants. Orange County head of treasury was Robert Citron. He was described as a stubborn gambler, but at his prime was also viewed as a savvy investor. His returns were historically good. He was aggressive and he always bet big on his belief of decreasing interest rates. In 1978, however, Proposition 13, also known as the Breakdown of Safe Municipal Fiscal Management, imposed a capped property tax. This created pressure to maintain municipal services and led to the need for alternative revenue strategies. In the early 1990s, the Orange County therefore started working with an investment pool, also called the Orange County Investment Pool. The Orange County Investment Pool was an investment vehicle through which the taxpayers' money was put to work. 189 public entities such as cities, school districts and water authorities entrusted their money to Robert Citron and invested it into the Orange County Investment Pool. Due to the pooling of funds, the investors saw huge economies of scale. Between 1991 and 1994, the size of the fund increased from $3 billion to $7.6 billion. Returns were running above 9%, while alternative investments only could only earn 5 to 6%. However, in 1994, the Fed tightened interest rates, and this caused Robert Citron's investment strategy to collapse. The loss for Orange County totaled $1.7 billion, and the county was forced to declare bankruptcy. Chapter 2. Financial Risks This debacle can be explained by two major causes. One, leverage with risky liabilities, and two, investing in risky assets. The main risk associated with Citron's investment strategy was market risk, since he was reliant on stable or declining interest rates. Beginning with the first cause, leverage with risky liabilities. In 1994, the Orange County Investment Pool contained $7.6 billion. Robert Citrone used the $7.6 billion to serve as collateral for borrowing another $13 billion. This technique is known as leverage, borrowing external funds to potentially increase the yield on the non-leveraged portion of the portfolio. Since the size of the pool now increased to $20.6 billion, the leverage ratio of Orange County was 2.7. This is a normal value for a company, but should not be the case for a county which uses taxpayers' money. Due to this leverage, all future evolutions of returns will be amplified. Due to the fact that Orange County isn't a bank, it was somewhat restricted in how it could achieve the desired level of leverage. The instrument that was chosen in this case was a repurchase agreement. In a repurchase agreement, Orange County would pledge its assets 7.6 billion dollars as collateral in order to receive short-term loans at very low rates. This money would then be invested at higher rates. This technique was motivated by the fact that collateralized loans are very inexpensive. The lower the cost of the short-term financing, the more beneficial the leverage becomes. Critical to this scheme was OCIP's ability to keep borrowing at a lower rate than it would invest at. However, the funding through the collateralized repo is risky since the value of the collateral itself is exposed to market risk. That is, the market value of the pledged security, which are the interest rate sensitive assets worth $7.6 billion, could decline when interest rates increase. This decline could potentially impose collateral calls 
making it necessary to pledge more assets as collateral. Continuing to the second cause, risky assets. Citron borrowed approximately $2 for every $1 on deposit, both borrowing short-term and investing long-term, as well as investing in exotic securities, whose yields were inversely related to interest rates. The composition of the investment portfolio is 58% in fixed income instruments, 26% in structured notes inverse filters, 3% in cash, and 13% other asset classes. In this portfolio, 84% of the assets was exposed to interest rate fluctuations. Only 16% was not exposed. Firstly, the fixed income instruments had long horizons funded by short-term borrowing. Again, this tactic subjected intermediate interest rate risk. Second, the use of inverse floaters, rate notes, will pay an interest amount which is inversely indexed to the benchmark rate, the interest rate. As rates decline, higher yields are achieved and vice versa. For example, suppose that the benchmark rate, which is the LIBOR, equals 3% for a six-month period. The inverse floater would be set at 7% for a six-month period, making the coupon payment equal to $2 million. If the LIBOR jumped to 4%, the coupon payment would fall to $1.5 million. Leverage inverse floaters were used, thus multiplying its effect on potential yields. The difference can be seen between the two. Consider an inverse floater that pays two times fixed interest rate set at 6% minus three times LIBOR. For a five-year $100 million inverse floater with 3% LIBOR, the coupon payment would be $1.5 million. For 4% LIBOR, the coupon payment would be zero. With an unlevered floater, a 1% change in the variable rate results in a 25% change in the coupon, opposed to the leveraged inverse floater, where a 1% change leads to 100% increase or decrease in coupon payment. Thirdly, low liquidity. Having only 3% cash in the portfolio can prove to be an issue when lenders require collateral calls on assets that decline in value. It also creates further difficulty for constituents of the fund to access capital. So what happened? Beginning in February of 1994, the Fed began to increase the interest rates. Citron displayed unwavering determination to maintain his strategy, although the market was shifting before his eyes. The effect to be felt on both liabilities and asset side. As interest rates went up, the value of the pledged securities declined. Because of this, the brokers who provided the loans demanded additional collateral to compensate for the reduced value of the pledged securities, which Citron could not supply. Additionally, Orange County's investment strategy was attacked from the asset side. Firstly, 26% of the portfolio was invested in inverse floaters, causing the assets to no longer generate income. Secondly, 58% of the portfolio consisted of long-term fixed income instruments, which were now declining in value. Thirdly, since the portfolio was not liquid enough to pay cash, Orange County had to sell off their securities. Losses accumulated to revision of market value that again urged collateral calls. Lenders were seeking payment and the county's assets were at risk. Buildings were on the verge of being seized, such as schools and water treatment facilities ultimately driving Orange County to seek bankruptcy protection from lenders. So what did we learn from this? Lesson one, the importance of self-assessment. After much success in his career, Citron's hubris clouded simple financial fundamental tools, such as value at risk and asset liability management. Since it is hard to assert a department led by a very popular treasurer, Citron's di dictatorial investment style deterred any advice from the powerless board of su supervisors. Next, lesson two, the need for governance. In the context of the fund, there should have been an implementation of safeguards to better protect the taxpayer's money, such as preventing the use of exotic securities, limiting leverage ratios, and conducting risk analysis. The planning for this investment style needs to be approved by a competent oversight committee. 
the investment decisions should not be centered on one or two individuals. Directives should mitigate risks such as poor oversight and eventually very costly mistakes. Lastly, lesson three, transparency towards stakeholders. Depositors should know what is going on with their funds, certainly when high leverage is being used. Therefore, the investment strategy should have been more transparent by providing investment reports and detailed information to all stakeholders, ensuring the depositors are aware of the risks being taken. Thank you.